All right, thank you for joining us here at SolarWinds. We're going to have a webcast about the five key metrics you need to be monitoring in your virtual environment. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Jared Hensel. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager here at SolarWinds. I've been in IT for 15 plus years, worked in small to medium businesses as well as Fortune 100 companies in their IT department. Uh, and now I'm over here at SolarWinds taking care of the virtualization product. I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, Therese Miller. Hi, glad to be here today. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Teresa Miller. I'm the founder and CEO of 24 by 7 IT Connection. I've been the, in the IT industry for 20 years now, and I recently made some big changes that really are going to uh, focus on and take 24 by 7 IT Connection to the next level. So I'm very excited um, as to what comes next. Awesome. Um, so the topic we're going to talk about again today is monitoring your virtual environment. So I guess the first question is going to be is why do you need to be monitoring uh, vSphere and your Hyper-V environments? Monitoring of really almost any environment is, is so critical. But when it comes to virtualization platforms like vSphere and Hyper-V, the first question I ask myself is, well, what, what would be the response if there was a problem that I had to be more reactive to instead of being proactive? So if there was an issue in my environment and my, my leader came to me and, and said, is there anything we could have done differently? If I hadn't put the right monitoring tool in place in advance, that would have left me in a, you know, a really bad situation. You don't want to be reactive. You always want to be proactive. And these two and Hyper-V, we're running most of our servers in the envir these environments these days. And so we want our systems up and running almost 100% of the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I know from my point of view, it, it, you can't use the standard, this is how I monitored Windows uh, tools or metrics to monitor a virtual environment. That they, they look completely different, so you, you would need the correct tool to uh, monitor those things to see it from their uh, their point of view. What are uh, the top five things you should be monitoring for your vSphere health? I, I assume they would be different than um, or possibly related to how you would just check a normal Windows server. Yeah, they definitely, there could be a little overlap and you'll, we'll, we'll see that as we start diving into this a little bit deeper, but you know, Windows servers versus that, that overall host, um, there are definitely some differences. So first of all, performance statistics for Windows. So this would affect our, our guest level um, operating system and our ability to know exactly what's going on with them. Every application is different and so knowing if you're getting the performance you need out of that system is really, really key when it comes to virtualization. Okay. Host performance, this is so important. The underlying host is what runs those, you know, potentially hundreds of servers for your environment. And if the performance of that host is not well, your environment could end up in a situation, and I've seen this happen before, where the host house was poor, and next thing you knew, you were in a situation where you couldn't even re-motion or move the guest off of that host. And so, knowing if there's any form of degradation starting can come from a really good monitoring tool, evaluating and watching what's going on with those hosts. Yeah, I, w I would absolutely agree on that point. You know, as great as virtualization uh, is, that it is all shared resources. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you have one bad piece of equipment, it's just not affecting one server. Uh, it could be affecting multiple servers or multiple workstations, that there is that massive uh, correlation between uh, objects in your virtual environment. Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit before we move to the next point, when I mentioned I've seen that before, mm -hmm. I mean, 
I have I've seen hosts again without the proper monitoring in place um, get to the point where they're literally calling app analysts to schedule downtimes on those systems in order to shut them down to be able to move them, and that is just not. That's just not good business. No. You need everything running all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most of us can justify uh, uptime SLAs with virtualization, but if you're not monitoring it, you've, you've shot yourself in the foot because uh, you've promised all the flexibility, but you weren't monitoring it and taking care of it and completely uh, ended up screwing multiple servers or multiple, multiple objects all at once. Right. Okay, so moving on to what you should be monitoring. I I keep licensing on my list. It is so easy to lose track of when renewals are happening. I mean, granted, your salespeople are usually going to reach out to you, but that that's assuming one big thing, that nobody has changed roles in the organization, nobody's left, um, or come and go, or the, the role may have transitioned, and so, what happens is if you're not monitoring the licensing and that renewal comes up and that person has left or in a new role but they don't actually share the fact that the renewal information came, you could get in a really bad situation if your, your environment couldn't continue to function because the licensing expired. No, I, I I did not think of this one originally, but you know I I would agree with it now because I've been in environments where, um, you know, individuals thought they bought, oh I, I this is licensed for ten nodes or ten sockets or 10, whatever it is, um, and they're not, you know, they they anticipated okay well we can continue to grow because we took care of this licensing and we've got some buffer room. Um, but when they do go to add additional hardware, they realize, oh, you know, I've, I'm not licensed for this. I can't add this to the cluster or something along those lines. So that is, that is an interesting um, thing to obviously uh, maintain and stay on and, and monitor. Yeah, I like your example, too. Um, not really understanding what you purchased or thinking you purchased something else is really another value add to monitoring that. I find anything that's software related, it tends to be a little bit more uh, difficult to grasp just because they can't put their hands on it. People can physically say, hey, I bought 10 servers, I can see them, I can touch them. Mm -hmm. But when it's all license keys, it, it's easy to have that piece of paper disappear or that email disappear and then nobody's none the wiser on what you're actually licensed or, uh, or have uh, ownership yeah. of. Exactly. So storage uses and disk performance. This is extremely important from the host level, but it's also uh, extremely important from the guest level. I've dealt with, my example here will be exchange focused. I have been in situations where the disk sizing, eventually the environment kind of outgrew what was originally put in place. And without having been monitoring the storage usage, it would have been really hard to tell when those exchange databases were ready to fill up. And so fortunately, in my example, we were monitoring that storage usage specifically tied to Microsoft Exchange. So we knew when we needed to start redesigning the storage for that environment so that people weren't constantly extending um, the disk sizes. but it's very important for, for all applications and the environment as a whole. Now, tied to that is disk performance, especially when you're talking about an application like uh, Microsoft Exchange and you're running that on VMware or Hyper-V. Disk performance, while it's, it's not as important as it used to be because they've rewritten Exchange, it still can degrade the performance of your application exchange included and so you need to know what's going on because your users in the environment if they're not getting what they need out of your systems from a performance perspective you're going to start getting complaints 
And honestly, I don't, I wouldn't want that to be me, right? I don't want to be the one that's receiving the message that things aren't functioning correctly and have it have been something like this performance or storage usage that I wasn't monitoring properly. Yeah, I mean, from my, my personal experience, it, you know, it always used to be a uh, blame the network guy, but then once you got into virtualization, it seemed to be uh, blame the storage guy because it definitely seems to be the hardest, um, or one of the harder things to grasp is when you're, you know, provisioning VMs, you could say, hey, I wanted to have two cores or this many, you know, uh, this many gigs of RAM. Um, and when storage, you, you know, initially you just go, okay, hey, I'm going to give it 100 gigs of storage but you're really not thinking about the throughput on there. And so I've just seen that kill so many environments that uh, a SQL query is messed up or something along those lines. And so you're really not accounting for a massive spike in, in IOPS and therefore driving latency across all the other VMs. And it will kill performance quicker than anything I've seen, yet it's really one of those things you're not uh, typically thinking about when building out or provisioning an environment or, or not paying attention to on a, on a daily basis. You're saying it's not always the network? I will admit that it's not always a network. I'm just going to point the finger at the storage person instead. <laughs> and then um, I guess going along with storage is your? The snapshots. Absolutely. Um, I, always, I find that from organization to organization, the way that they handle snapshots is different. Some organizations have hosts that you know, can handle some level of snapshots and others don't size for it. And so regardless of the situation, whichever environment you're in, you should still be monitoring snapshots. Um, if snapshots get left there for a long period of time, they can take a really long time to delete. And also, you know, they can actually contribute to performance degradation if they get too big. So I really think that knowing how long a server snapshot's been there is valuable regardless of whether or not you can keep it there for a day or a week. No, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I've gotten into many discussions where snapshots are not back up. I think that could be a webcast all in itself. Um, but that, you know, they do have a purpose. You're applying an update or a hot fix. Totally, yeah, that makes sense. Snapshot the VM and, and do what you need to do. But you know, it is one of those things that you stay on top of how old the snapshots are, how big they are. Don't, you know, don't think you, I'm going to do a monthly uh, snapshot of my VM going back the last two years and it's going to be my backup. That is uh, going to cost you dearly. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if you had to go back to that, that's an interesting point. If somebody actually tried to keep a snapshot for two years, I, I think that that's just setting yourself up for failure. Oh, I absolutely agree. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, I, you need backup. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they, I completely agree. They're two different things. They both serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah. you know, I, I've heard questions and, and it's come up, you know, obviously VMware is the predominant hypervisor out there in the market and, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V is gaining steam. Is there anything different when it comes to monitoring those two? Uh, is there any key metrics or, you know, how do you treat them? So to me, a, a hypervisor is a hypervisor when it comes to monitoring. Of course, from a features perspective, they're not created equal. Um, but monitoring is so similar. Um, you really can take those top five we just talked about, but I just want to call out the core basics of this too, right? You've got the CPU and memory being extremely important at both the host and guest level, even if it's Hyper-V, you need to know what's going on. And then that disk I.O., you need to know if our storage is healthy and functioning and performing for our environment, the same way we discussed for vSphere. And those snapshots again, we need to know if someone has a snapshot that's been out there for a day, a week, and I really, really hope I'd never find one for two years. <laughs> but I suppose anything is possible when you're not monitoring. Yeah, absolutely. Those will, you know, it's one of those that 
somebody did it and, and totally forgot about it. And the VM's running. You know, you're not sitting there. There's not a, a blinking light in your face or anything like that. It is one of those that you just did it and on a whim or for a reason at some point in time and never came back to it. So, um, you know, okay, so we, we've talked about CPU, memory, disk. You know, what are actual metrics or counters or anything we should be um, uh, are monitoring? You know, what, what are we exactly looking for? Yeah, so from the infrastructure side, to me, number one, the first thing I would be looking at is if I um, were just trying to understand the overall house of my vSphere or Hyper-V environment, is I would take a look at the host level CPU and memory utilization. And as you can see here in this chart, I mean, it is just so easy to, to dive in and see that, you know, my CPU environment for my host in the last 24 hours has been really nice and low. And host CPU and memory performance health will lead to a very successful and healthy guest operating system environment. All of those applications your organization runs because this is all shared really will be very health healthy and function extremely well if the host is performing the way it should. Um, you know, I, I guess the question comes up is, you know, the reason we went to virtualization is or virtualized was because we are using minor bits of CPU and memory or not using it to its fullest extent, you know, in your opinion, where, what percentage do you usually try to cap out on a host? Do you want to run it at 99% or do you want to say, hey, and that 70% utilization is where I want to kind of max it out at? Yeah, so you would, you would never want your CPU or memory to be maxed out on a host. My guidelines fall within the realm of redundancy. Okay. So I feel like if my environment has two hosts that support a portion of my business, neither one should ever be above 50%. Yeah, because yeah. if I lose one of those hosts, I mean, even 50% is like really pushing it. I feel like the right answer is more like 25 to 30%. If I lost a host, I need all of my servers to run on one until I can get that other host back up and running. Yeah, yeah I would agree that it is, a, it is a function of how big your environment is and how much you're willing to lose, um, you know, for in an NHA point of view. Absolutely. So running, yeah, running light, you, almost, you don't want to be running heavy on resources on the host. Okay, so then we've got, you know, is there anything we need to be looking at differently at a guest level or is, um, it, how, do, how would we compare guest CPU versus host CPU? They really are, they're two, they're two different things. Okay. You know, host level is the bigger, it's the bigger picture for that server environment. It's how much memory that's available. And it's letting me know how much I'm using. From the guest level, it's, it's about giving the application what it needs to function. And actually, that's one of the, the beautiful things about application virtualization. I can tell a particular application server that it, it could use up to 6 gig of memory, but because there are configuration options that don't force me to commit that level to that particular guest, if they're only using 2 gig, then it doesn't matter that it's 6 gig applied to the OS. So guest level monitoring is different and it's very specific to the application. Just going back one more time to the host level, the host level monitoring is giving you a bigger picture of what all 
all of the Windows servers in your virtual environment are actually using. Mm -hmm. And what I do like on both of these uh, screenshots is that you can see, um, I, I'm going to say the parent-child, but you, the host-VM relationship. Um, you know, it is great to see that, hey, um, you know, this VM is running at two, less than 2% uh, CPU and the host is at 12% uh, CPU. So I would have knowledge right here and be able to visibly see that if this VM was running hot, let's say it was in the 80 percentile CPU, obviously the CPU on the host would bump up some, but I'd be able to see that there is that room to grow. I can make that change. Um, you know, if both the CPU on the VM and the CPU on the host were 80 plus percent, I don't have that ability or I shouldn't be going, well, let's just give it a couple more cores on this host because it's just not really available. It's already running hot and heavy. So, um, you know, I think seeing both of that relationship in multiple screens is, is advantageous to knowing uh, actions you can take or steps you can take to uh, optimize performance. That's a really good point because it can be, it, sometimes those that are managing the, the, the host environment they can probably see guests and hosts, but sometimes those that manage the guests, like they wouldn't have the insights into the, the host without knowing this. And then going back to their, their VMware team and saying, you know, I think that looking at this, I would have a, a good idea that I could request additional resources. Now, if this were a situation like you mentioned, like if something were maxed out at like 80% and the host was really maxed out in terms of resources too, then it's almost like it's time to start having a conversation about adding hosts to your environment and distributing that load better. What does it mean to um, add a project for planning for expansion? Because that environment, that situation you described, would leave, leave, could leave a bad situation should something fail. Absolutely, and I think you know having all this visibility in a single pane of glass or single location because you're going to have your exchange uh, person or uh, SQL person asking for, oh, I need 32 gigs of RAM and 16 cores and all this, and and then not knowing in context to what the actual virtual environment can support. You know that th these screens do. Uh, I don't want to say settle arguments, but they do show you the uh, you know what what's possible. You know, if it's if it is maxed out, or if it can support additional resources, or anything along those lines, um, you know, then we've got you know storage. What are your thoughts on that? What should we be monitoring? Yeah, yeah. So the storage performance um, situations I've been in, um, the biggest one where there can be issues and things that I look for, are like the IOP, um, but then how that's tied to any latencies that might be occurring as a result of that. I think in some ways, having this option of just seeing latency is almost more powerful. Um, so IOPS are important to me, but I love, I love that this demonstrates a really quick insight into whether or not something is performing the way it should from a storage perspective. Like we talked about before, how storage can so negatively affect application performance. You know, we can't we can't go to the network team anymore without checking these types of things first. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree because I, you know, um, personal experience in the last couple of years. I mean, IOPS are great, but with the um, additional, you know, software defined storage and the all flash arrays. You know, saying, "Oh, hey, a thousand IOPS is as much as I'm going to get," or whatever it is, it, it's no longer the case. Um, you know, the last five five years, you know, IOPS can be through the roof now with the new technology available to, to a lot of businesses. Where latency, uh, five milliseconds or twenty milliseconds or hundred milliseconds, that's still the same a year ago, five years ago. I mean, that that has not changed. So I think it's a, a function of your IOPS, but. Truly, IOPS um, themselves have the capacity, I think, has skyrocketed the last couple of years. So 
uh, going back to what you said is, you know, um, latency, I think, is the key performance that somebody's going to, uh, an end user is going to call you about of, hey, this is waiting. I see the hourglass, not, hey, I, I'm pushing 10,000 IOPS. I think I'm going to think I'm running hot. You know, they're not going to know that. They're just going to, they're just going to see that hour waiting glass going, what the heck's going on? Why is this taking so long? Right. Right. Yeah. This latency view really does summarize very nicely um, um, what they could be experiencing and why. You know, and I think going back to other things you've talked about, it, it is all relative though. Um, you know, I do think you know, if you have a, a, a pure array in there that, you know, hey, I'm go I want to be alerted at five milliseconds because that's abnormal. Um, but if I've got my cold storage sitting on 7,200 RPM SATA disks or something like that, okay, you know, five milliseconds, that, that's awesome performance. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could be, right. you know, you're putting your company picnic photos over there that it doesn't need to be instantaneous where uh, SQL databases or your ERP that uh, is sitting on some sort of a, uh, you know, solid state array would want to be. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, you brought up this, the, the snapshot sizing and aging. Uh, you know, I definitely think that's something to, uh, to look at. Yeah, and this is a really nice summary of the different snapshots and how large they are. And really, awesome that you can actually just delete those snapshots, right? Can you do that right from here? Yeah, yeah. if you actually, uh, in the product, yeah. if you actually click delete snapshot, you would see the whole tree of snapshots. It, it could just be one snapshot yeah. or it could be four or five. I guess that, that's a good question to ask though is, in your opinion um, or experience, what would hurt performance more? Is it is it the size of the snapshot or is it the amount of snapshot or, or you know, 10, Small snapshots, any worse performance than one larger snapshot? It's always when I hit the delete, but I feel like things slow down. Uh, but again, it depends on how big that was and how much storage is on the back end. It, it, it really, in the end, depends on the sizing of the environment, too. I've, I've worked in organizations and where they've allowed snapshots to hang around for a couple of weeks, even capturing memory. And when that was removed, there still was no issue. But I've also dealt with situations in an environment where, like I said, deleting that snapshot, it felt like it just, like I needed to do that off hours because it really, really created a performance bottleneck on the system. Gotcha. I mean, it... it yeah, I, I think it's one of those that if you're maintaining it all the time, and you, you you learn as you go too. You know, you will know that hey, this this particular storage device is going to allow for a little bit more leniency on the number of snapshots or size versus mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, there's I don't think there's a clear cut rule. I mean, it does come down to everybody's environment. And every environment is unique. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we've got the basic you know CPU, memory, disk uh, at the host and the guest level. Is there is there something that you find that it is missed or um, you know you, you think one person's watching it or nobody's watching it or you're just not thinking about it at all? Yeah, so definitely. One of the things that I find people forget to monitor is like the network card and the traffic tied to it. it I think people assume that the network team is, is doing that end-to-end -end monitoring. And in most environments, they are. But how wonderful to be able to take a look, if you're monitoring it, what's going on with that network card and any particular traffic tied to it before you'd even call the networking team to say, hey, I'm having an issue. Because if you don't see anything going on here, if you're not mo if you're monitoring it the way you should be, then the likelihood is you probably don't need to give them a call. There's probably something else going on. No, and uh, what have you seen? Uh, and I would agree with um, you know I, I know before we talked about me uh, goofing off saying that it's always the network fault. Um, kind of sandbagging on those people, though I have seen the network team go in there and make switch configurations that 
um, you know, were not propagated down to the correct server teams, and we did not make server changes on our network cards, you know, and we were misconfigured. You know, we had two hard code settings in there. Um, it wasn't something that they were monitoring. They just made a change, and we were unaware of it. Um, you know, and definitely this is something that you would see here that if, if you didn't have the duplex set up right or anything along those lines that uh, talk about performance killer right there is just the two teams not talking to one another, um, you know, that, that will kill it real quick on, on VM performance and throughput. Um, you know, and especially because, you know, you get some things inside of, uh, I've, you know, talked to somebody recently that they were saying they moved to a host and um, or moved a VM to a new host and they said you know performance was worse and, and they swore that it was something on that host and it, you know it didn't seem to be CPU and memory because those seemed to check out he basically was uh, uh, not able to confirm until he looked at a different tool that he, there was packet loss on there you know and it was only this host and um, you know it, it killed every time they put VMs on there it was, it was the black sheep of the family for a while don't put any VMs on this host because it's just I, I think there's packet loss and there wasn't any real visibility into it until he used a different tool to, to peek around the back end. And so if they had been doing network mo card monitoring of their own, this would have stood out? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it was something, you know, yeah. that you know, you're trying to work with multiple teams to figure out and what would be a five-minute process if you had the correct tools turns into a, a two-day escalation template, it seems like. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you were saying that you were talking about that host, um, it made me think of a conversation I had recently, like, was that host number 13? <laughs> like, if you're superstitious, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe that was host number 13, and it, you know, had some sort of superstitious tie to it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know what host number it was, but I know definitely he said he, he was able to fix it, but, you know, he needed the right tool to... To, to prove and know it was a networking issue. I, I didn't ask if it was uh, something that needed to be switched on the, on, the, on the switch side or on the host side, but they determined it was a networking issue on that host once they had the correct data visible. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so we've talked about now, uh, you know, we're going to monitor from a host point of view. We're going to monitor from a guest point of view. We're going to look at storage. I, I guess how long do you keep this data? I mean, I, I guess inevitably somebody's going to say, oh, forever, that, forever. And then once you really sit down yeah. and say forever is not the answer, w what's your suggestion on that? Yeah, so to me, it, it, it's that it depends. It's the, and I know that, that it can be really a generalization, but you really need to take a look at the type of data that you feel is useful to going back to. So, if I were monitoring CPU, for example, is it really valuable to have CPU data from a year ago? I'm thinking probably not. I'm even thinking like a few months is probably too long. Because once you start, if you're monitoring, you're, you're already being notified that there were CPU issues and you're going to start researching it right away. So in that situation, I personally feel like CPU usage three months top. And I would probably treat like memory the same way. When I'm looking at storage I.O. and latency, you know, again, it's one of those things. You might need to keep it for a few months because if you can't track down the issue right away and you've got some trending you can go back to, but you know, those are, those are situations where, you know, some people might come back and say, well, I don't, even, I don't even care if I go back two weeks. If I have an issue, I'm going to check it out, and two weeks is too much. Yeah, I, so, would, I would agree. If you were going back three months to troubleshoot a problem, you, you probably were not doing your job for the last three months if you needed, yeah. if you finally decided to look at the red blinking light for CPU. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I feel like, especially where you're troubleshooting, most of that information is only valuable while the issue is occurring. Now, an argument to keeping something like that for a few months, like let's go back to the CPU and memory, would be, okay, I resolved the issue. The issue went away for two months. And then 
EP started climbing, you know, and acting, acting up again. It might be nice to be able to run a report just to see if the patterns are the same, just to see if there's any correlation before you start working on your new issue. So in that case, I feel like reporting and historical could provide value going back a few months, but for an immediate issue, yeah, a couple weeks, probably the case. Uh, agreed, and you know, I, I... I think another thing that I always thought about was, um, you know, how much space can you give me for to put these logs? Um, you know, if you're going to want to back up hundreds or thousands of VMs and or hundreds of thousands of hosts and have all this data, it, it doesn't it be, doesn't become a trivial amount. It adds up. So if you're like, hey, I can give you a hundred gigs of storage of uh, for your SQL backend or whatever, that's probably not going to let you go back. Um, a far time amount in time. I guess it depends on also if you're looking at hourly or anything along those lines. If you're doing you know synthetic rollups, but you know it it does matter when these people want to go. Hey, I, I need to know exactly what the CPU and memory was doing on on in January down to Tuesday. Um, well, you're definitely going to need the back end storage to accommodate all of that data. Um, you know, and that that seems to quickly adjust the conversation of how much data they want to now keep. <laughs> right, that's an additional cost. And back to your point, I mean, if something's been going on that long, has the job been really done correctly? I, I agree with that statement. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think there, there are some scenarios where you do need to see some, maybe some one-off correlating data, but typically, um, I, I would agree with you know that you want data right now, maybe going back a couple days to see if it happened recently or something like that. But you know if you're having to constantly look at data that's a month or two months old, you're an, as an administrator probably not doing your job as effectively as you should be, and there's there's issues in your environment. Yeah. Now back to my comment of a few months. That to me is reporting. Yep. More than anything. And there are even situations I didn't talk about, again, tied to reporting. If the type of data is good for looking back historically, I've even, I've even captured up to, you know, a year of information. But, you know, it, it, again, it, it, it depends. And, um, but that's more reporting and historical than real-time troubleshooting. No, and those are two different use cases. You uh, brought up a great yeah. a great point. Is you know if you're doing reporting for executives, that those are going to be probably different metrics than granular CPU per VM per hour troubleshooting type metric that you'd need to be looking at. Right. Well, I I think we've kind of talked about most of uh, of the things you need to cover. For virtual uh, monitoring a virtual environment, it, it's been very helpful because, you know, in talking to people in the past, they, they don't know what to look for um, or what metrics to really uh, to view because there are thousands of them. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you're just going to possibly give up and throw your hands up and just kind of walk away from it or, or hopefully not walk away from it, but, you know, just be in a constant reactive mode that if you are monitoring um, things, you know, these metrics proactively that you're going to have a much more stable environment. So uh, I, I appreciate your time today, Teresa. Thank you so much. Um, I, I definitely think this uh, is going to be a, a worthwhile thing for to look at. And I think a bunch of administrators are going to look at this and, and possibly add some new metrics or new ways to monitor things in their environment. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great. Um, and just to echo your point on um, being proactive, I, I as we mentioned at the beginning, it, it goes a long way and it, it definitely makes you and the IT organization look really, really good if you can be on top of things instead of just fighting fires all the time. So it's good stuff. So again, thank you so much for having me and everyone have a, a great day. All right. Thank you guys.